This is Lawrence Sherman from the Global Fertility Academy. Recently, in Lisbon, Portugal, during the 31st annual ESHRAE meeting, I sat down with some of the world's top thought leaders and discussed the challenges and opportunities faced in fertility today. Join me for this very exciting interview. Well, I'd like to thank all of you for agreeing to join <coughs> us and talk about these very interesting <coughs> topics within fertility medicine. The way I'd like to start is just go around the table and briefly introduce yourself, your affiliation, and where within fertility medicine your expertise is. So, Filippo, why don't you start for us? Yes, thank you, Lawrence. I am uh, Filippo Baldi. i Italian. I live in Rome. I'm a medical doctor, obstetric gynecologist, and uh, since 24 years I work in the infertility field. So I am a reproductive medical doctor. And uh, I'm the clinical director of the um, Center for Reproductive Medicine Genera in Rome and other three cities in Italy. Perfect, thank you. Bashar. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Bashar Balaban. I'm from Turkey, Istanbul. I work uh, in a private hospital, American hospital. And I've been in the clinical embryology field for almost 20 years. And I'm the lab director in this uh, American hospital since 1996. Uh, and besides uh, being the lab director, I have been uh, also uh, occupied as the society uh, chairs of uh, some clinical embryology societies. Great. Thank you. Thank you. PC. Hi, I'm uh, PC Wong and I'm from Singapore. I'm a professor of obstetrics and gynecology at the uh, National University of Singapore as well as the director of the IVF program at the National University Hospital. And uh, I've been in IVF for quite a long time and particularly interested in, uh, in uh, medical education and uh, training in the area of IVF. Great, thank you. Pasquale. Thank you, Lawrence. I'm uh, Pasquale Patrizio and uh, I am the uh, professor of obstetrics and gynecology and uh, director of the Yale Fertility Center and Fertility Preservation Program. I've been in doing this work for more than uh, 23, 24 years. And uh, I uh, also specialized in male infertility, so when I treat the couple as a, as a, uh, as a whole. And in addition to uh, reproductive uh, uh, problems, we also do a lot of uh, laparoscopy, endoscopy cases just pertaining to, uh, to infertility. And uh, lately I became president of the International Society of uh, Fertility Preservation. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Atsushi? I'm uh, Atsushi Tadaka from Japan. I'm the director <coughs> of the St. Mel Hospital. Uh, which was uh, studied about 25 years ago. Um, in our clinic, we have uh, 8,000 cycles a year, and uh, now I'm very interested in uh, rescue the age of state. So this year, the UK Parliament proved to use the uh, exchange of cytoplasmic for the uh, treatment of mitochondrial diseases. Now I'm planning to use this uh, technique Prior for the aged, uh, rescue age of state. And also, I am interested in the male infertility. So, Rossi uh, is now I'm uh, doing everything, but uh, success rate is not so high. But we have uh, over 300 cases, but nobody believe it. But now <laughs> I am subscribed my paper to the human reproduction. So now I'm doing uh, all around uh, uh, FTD treatment. Thank you. Oh, great, thank you. Ala. My name is Ala Kalungina. I am from Russia. I am a um, professor of obstetric gynecologist uh, of uh, the first state uh, medical university. I am a deputy head doctor, obstetric uh, gynecologist, clinic Ava Peter, net clinic Ava Peter. I have uh, worked in field of uh, IVF from 1995. Uh, my uh, area of expertise is uh, reproductive medicine. I am fertility specialist, and um, I. 
pay a great attention to uh, the f area of um, fertility preservation in cancer patients. Thank you. Well, great, thank you. I, I did a little math while you were all talking, and it shouldn't surprise you that combined and collectively you were working in fertility medicine for over 100 years. Uh, I, I don't know if that surprises you when we sort of look at it that way, but that doesn't mean anybody's very old. It just means there's a lot of experience at the table, and that's a great thing. And that sort of leads me into where I want to start. Interestingly, around the table, we have sort of different backgrounds and different parts within fertility medicine. And it's interesting because it's one of the places where we really see interprofessional teams working together, and really a place where we see interprofessional education, where we deliver it so it's meant for each of the component team members. I think we'd all agree that we're all involved in that. How do you see the role of each of those team members evolving as more and more technology changes and more and more opportunities exist within fertility treatments? And uh, <clears throat> Filippo, you're looking at me. Why don't we start with you? I firmly believe that uh, <laughs> what we clinicians do is not the most important part. The most important part is then uh, in the lab. And uh, answering to your question, I believe that uh, the most important advancement has done and has to be done in the lab. So uh, what we clinicians can do mainly is to manage women and the couple in the right way, is to do, of course, a good and uh, correct controlled ovarian stimulation, uh, of course, doing a good oocyte retrieval and a good <coughs> transfer. But if you do all these things, but you, do, you, you have a very not excellent lab, then you will not have a, a live bird. So the laboratory is uh, uh, maybe, according to what I think, uh, the most important part of the job. And uh, the technological advancement has to be done and have been done in the lab so far. And it's really important the way you frame that because as you look at the team you see the importance of all of the components Absolutely. of the team. And I think that sort of talks to this specialty more than a lot of other ones. Uh, Pasquale, you're a lab director certified, tr true? True. So, so do you agree <laughs> with what uh, Filippo says? Completely. Uh, in addition I would say that uh, even though we may give a different point of importance to the different aspects of, uh, of a clinical operation and the role of the laboratory uh, personnel is, uh, is really critical, still I want to stress that it is a team, uh, a team operation and uh, every single component of the team is, a, is an important component for the success of, uh, of, uh, of the clinic. Uh, we do have uh, clinical care teams, uh, which means that from the moment the patient has been uh, uh, making, a, made, making an appointment, appointment to see a, a doctor, then is going to be uh, seen by a clinical care team, which is not only the physician that she sees, but is going to be also one or two uh, uh, nurses or medical assistant which are going to be the reference point for the multiple phone calls during the multiple steps from the moment that she is uh, receiving medications, uh, monitoring phone calls for instructions, then it goes to into the lab. The lab is going to be continuously updated about how that progress goes via electronic medical records. So everybody knows when a cycle started, where is in the point that particular patient is in the journey to get to the egg retrieval. And then the laboratory at that point takes priority in information. So in a way that the entire team is, is, uh, is made available uh, to all the things that are going on. Even now I'm here in, in this meeting, but I already know what happened today because I get in, you know, emails, I can access to electronic medical records with, with different apps. So, and that's the beauty that everybody works together. Uh, in, the, in, in the team. Well, I think you might have been reading ahead in the playbook because we're going to talk a little bit about some of that stuff in just a little bit. So I'm glad you, you already sort of started leading into that. 
sort of pathway. That's good stuff. Basha, yes. so from the embryologist's point of view, yes. how do you feel first about what uh, Pasquale and Filippo just said, and then where do you sort of fit in on, on how you feel about the team-based practice and the team-based learning? Mm -hmm. Well, I completely agree uh, to their indications, and it's a pleasure to hear this actually from the clinicians, you know, that indicate that the key role is mainly on the embryology in this uh, ART field. And uh, often the infertility specialist, there's an indication saying that a good clinician cannot compensate the mistakes of a bad embryologist, <laughs> but a good embryologist can compensate the mistakes of a good clinician. So this is often said uh, in between the infertility specialist, which is uh, completely true. And considering the uh, changements, the dynamic changements within our field, I think everybody would agree on the point that the majority of the changes are mainly uh, held on the embryology laboratory. So it is of great importance for the lab director to be scientifically evidence-based and uh, to be capable of uh, following the uh, scientific improvements uh, in order to dynamically upgrade the laboratory for constant success. Excellent. Ala, from the perspective of where you practice, do you feel mm -hmm. the same or is it different? Uh, no, I entirely agree that uh, uh, role uh, every member of um, uh, international um, interprofessional team um, can be um, cannot be um, overestimated uh, because uh, our results uh, depends uh, from um, best practice every every member of team, but. Um, to create um, the good team, um, so very very difficult, and um, it is um, um, it is um, necessary um, good management. Uh, it is necessary, um, I think, um, quality control system to help us um, cor correct manage. Mm, and um, it's um, um, so difficult. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it mm -hmm. seems that at least around the table so far, uh, there's consensus about the, the team. So I'm going to change the question mm -hmm. a little bit uh, as I look to uh, Atsushi maybe. So I, I assume that you agree that the, the, the team needs to work together and needs to learn together. What are some ways that you think we could improve the communication between the members of the team. So Pasquale sort of alluded to the electronic medical records, but how else can we improve the communication between the members of that team? Yes, it's a very difficult problem, but it's a very important thing. So after a long uh, period, we reach the one goal, is uh, internal uh, audit, so inspection each other. So uh, sometimes it's very severe to criticize each other, but uh, after all, it's very fruitful. So now we perform the internal audit uh, once uh, uh, six months, mm -hmm. and also we have uh, external inspection, so to inspect each other from the different hospitals, team came to the hospital and check following the uh, manual. So these inspection audit each other. I think it's a good thing to maintain the quality. Yes. And, and so the, the team <coughs> checks the team. Yes, and also at the circuit and from the external circuit, we prepare all of the member, staff, prepare for it. So we have to have a sense of uh, team medicine. We are a team. So in such a case, we put together to so prepare for the external circuit or uh, audit. So PC, you do a lot of training. Yes. And I assume a lot of that training is interprofessional. 
How do you see ways and what techniques might you use to improve that communication amongst the team? What I've done with our center is to have a very uh, flat organization. So the, tri the tripartite team, uh, the doctor, the physician, the embryologist, and the nurses. And we, I encourage a lot of crosstalk. And it's not a top-down kind of a structure. And it's very, very flat. And uh, so how I encourage that is that uh, we do have uh, weekly meetings when we discuss our patients and everybody sits around the table and we discuss very, very freely. If we get a problem, if there's a problem in the lab, this is surface and we discuss it. So it's everybody's responsibility. It's not just the nurses or the physician or the laboratory. And we do this, we discuss every patient and we discuss at our level. Uh, in order to standardize this, we have uh, a lot of uh, standard operational procedures, SOPs, on uh, every procedure that we do is all documented there. And uh, this is what um, Dr. Narta alluded to about quality control. So we do a lot of these uh, QMS as well as to check. And uh, in order to make them, the next thing I did was in order to make them all up to speed, I have a lot of in-house uh, updates so we do teach each other and uh, we update each other so i have a lot of in-house training and wherever we lack i make sure that we send them out uh, to courses or to, to conference and all that so that and then when they come back we educate each other or what we have learned so that way everybody feels that they're part of a, of a team and uh, so some people maybe have the opportunity <coughs> to go out this year the others will go next year for example but everybody sort of learn uh, what's happening in S3DC or ASRM. So that's what the few things that we, we try to do to improve the interprofessional uh, team communication as well as uh, keeping them up to speed in terms of uh, updates. So it sounds like you subscribe to the if they learn together, they play better together. Yes, yes. And I think it's important to, for everybody to understand uh, what are the uh, developments currently happening in the field, right? So you may be applying to nurses or embryologists, but everybody seems to have an idea. Of course, uh, we don't expect our nurses to know too much in detail, but do you know roughly what's happening, you see? Well, you know, it's interesting you say that. We see that in medicine across the board, that sometimes there's expectations of what each other know, yes. but the reality is they're not quite sure of what the other people are going to do, and then when there's a handover of the patient, yes. in some cases, there was an expectation and something might not have been done. So I, I think the model you're using is terrific. Uh, Bashak, I'll pick on you because you're the embryologist at yes. the table. Um, how do you feel uh, about the education that you see and about the communication between you and other embryologists and the rest of the teams in which uh, they treat the patients? Mm -hmm. Well, within the laboratory, it is of great importance that the lab director uh, in routine practice uh, periodically trains the other embryologists to standardize the procedures in the laboratory. And uh, as he also indicated, it is of great importance that we have an upgraded version of SOPs, standard operating manuals, which uh, should be well known by all the staff. And the laboratory director should be uh, in charge uh, of this by uh, periodically training the embryologists in the lab. It is very important that everyone working in clinical uh, embryology uh, is aware of the uh, changements that are held in the laboratory. So that's interesting. It seems again that we're at a, a consensus on how best to communicate, how best to overcome the obstacles of communication if they exist, and how best to optimize the, the function of the team. Let's turn a little bit now to think about the journey of the patient or the couple undergoing ART. They can encounter a lot of obstacles. What are some tips and tricks that you might be able to provide to, to other specialists to help overcome some of the more commonly encountered obstacles? And I'll leave it sort of up to you to figure out which obstacles you'd like to talk about. So Filippo, I'll put you on the spot and let's yeah. start with you. Yeah, the, the main important obstacles that uh, we see routinely is that uh, the uh, specialist, the andrologist or the gynecologist that do not work in the field of reproductive medicine, very often they do not allot how important 
is the time that they make the patients lose doing very often completely useless things, completely useless exams, completely useless, okay, don't worry, you will do it if you do this or if you do that, that are completely useless. But what I found that is incredible, at least in Italy, is that uh, very few doctors know how important is the age of the woman. I mean, if you have a woman of 30 years, then uh, the, uh, you can afford to spend even uh, six, seven months more doing uh, uh, not really a specific um, um, follow-up in the, in, the, in the specific exam and so on. But if you have a woman of 40, you cannot do at that woman of 40 what you will do in uh, under 30. So uh, I think that in our colleagues, gynecologists and andrologists, what they need is to know some basic things of reproductive medicine, just not to uh, l make the patients to lose a lot of time. This is, I think, is the most important thing. So, Ala, I see you nodding, right? And, and I know we've actually talked about this before. Um, do you see that, uh, that, aware that basic awareness amongst the, the OBGYN or the andrologist as being a big obstacle? Mm -hmm. and, and how do you try to fix that problem when you encounter it? Uh, yes, um, uh, unfortunately, uh, we have um, uh, some problems with our um, uh, colleague uh, andrologist and uh, oncologist uh, because um, um, this is a different uh, direct, and um, uh, uh, there is uh, no good collaboration. It's uh, it's the big problem for us. Uh, but um, uh, we uh, um, currently we um, we carry out um, meeting with our colleagues and uh, discuss about our problems. Uh, but um, uh, we have we have not a good results for for that. Uh, but um, we have to continue this uh, practice and um, um, make collaboration with our um, specialists. You, you know, it sounds almost like <coughs> they don't realize the important role on the team that they play, that initial identification and referral. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know if you can say like that. I mean, you are talking now about uh, someone that is out of the team. These are uh, yes. gynecologists that are not part of a particular group yeah. or a particular center that is doing specifically the work that, that we do. But I also thought your question was a little bit different than what we've been talking in the last uh, uh, few rounds. And you asked what are the possible obstacles that a woman that is already, or a couple that has already been decided to put through ART is encountering. Mm -hmm. So perhaps what we've just discussed is a very important problem, but it's a problem on uh, education of the OBGYN community or your referral sources. You are talking about uh, obstacles of a couples going through ART. So that's uh, a different set of, uh, of problems. One, you know, the communication with the clinical care team. The couple that is coming, they may or may not be aware of all the steps that they have to do. Some they are aware because they've been already doing this research on, the, on their own in the internet. And especially in the United States, most of the couples, they are very well prepared, which we love when they already have an understanding of the processes. But uh, for many others, they don't. So then uh, here is the, pro the, the, the possibility for us to intervene in making the, in making the various steps less difficult, less mysterious. So we have uh, booklets, we have uh, web links that they can understand the various steps. They sit one-to-one -one with the clinical care team nurse to understand how the protocol has to be done. 
they have the telephone number to that particular clinical care team if there are questions. When they start the, the, the process, they know in the morning when they come for monitoring, what is going to happen in the afternoon when, when the nurse is going to call, what's going to happen when you have to do the, that most important injection of the cycle, why is the most important. So everything is going to be repeated and then they are going to be in contact with the embryologist and then they are going to be having another discussion with the doctors at the time of the embryo transfer and so forth. So it's kind of uh, taking them by hand and during the various steps, continuous explanation, material of information. They, they get a little booklet when they, they finish the transfer where they say what's going to happen on day one with your eggs, what's going to happen on day two, on day three, phone call from the lab. So they know all the steps, what to expect. Right. And that really is a big removal of the anxiousness, the fear, the unknown. And we found it very, very helpful. Uh, and of course, in the United States, I, I talk for, for my own country there, the big has, uh, obstacle is uh, to get approval from insurance to have, mm. to have the cycle paid. So there is a lot of stress that is going on there because one thing is, okay, I need to do in vitro, I need to do ART. All right, but I also have to work with my own insurance and get an authorization sent to the Yale Fertility Center or to any other center that says, okay, you can go ahead and do it. And no, that's, that's very... That pre-approval. Yes. Atsushi, you're, you're nodding. You agree with uh, Pasquale and his... Yeah, his very, very much, yes. I think the good majority of anxiety patients coming from the uh, repeated failures and the financial problems. <coughs> so I believe the most important thing is uh, detailed explanation and counseling for the patient. Yep. So these two parties uh, play a very crucial uh, role for make them continue the treatment. And also if I may add uh, to what uh, uh, Sushi said, you know, one of the main problems that we have not been yet to solve completely, we solved partially but not completely, is the returning of phone calls to patients while they are doing the treatment. And uh, we solved it partially with the use of electronic medical records. So because everything now is in, uh, on computer, the patient that comes also receive a, a keyword, password, for accessing to her own chart. So from her own computer at home, she can get access to what is called my chart. Mm -hmm. And she sees the results, for example, of the labs that we did. She sees what's happened on day one, because everything is available for her and only her to, to, to take a look at it. But still, we have not been able to solve at least another 50% of phone calls for, for questions that are, c cannot be put in the, in, in the EMR. PC, you looked like uh, you were jotting down some notes there. Did you want to add to this uh, topic? Yeah. I think I would uh, reiterate what Pasquale said about uh, uh, knowledge. The advantage I have is that when the patients come to us and we are ready to go on to IVF, they would have gone on the internet. So that's one of the great advantages of the internet. But however, all, generally not all the information they have are correct. correct. I, I would say most of them have patchy information. So what we try to make up for it is that before they start an IVF, we have at least three counseling sessions. One with the physician, yeah. one with my nurses, and I also conduct a group session, I call it the IVF patient seminar on a Saturday afternoon. For three hours, I get about 15 couples, and we talk everything about IVF. So at the end of these three sessions, once they enroll on the program, they are pretty knowledgeable about what's going to happen with our program on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, our electronic medical records are not accessible to patients like Pasquale. But what, how we overcome that is that from the day of oocyte retrieval until the day of embryo, until the day of cryopreservation of em spare embryos, our embryologists give a call to the patients yeah. every morning after they have checked the embryos and say, look, today is what happened to your embryos, how many cleave and all that. So that gave them tremendous uh, reassurance that somebody, our embryologist now, is looking after their eggs and embryos every day and they yep. get an update. So tremendous. Yep. 
And uh, so we give them, the other thing that we have is a hotline, a 24-hour hotline. So once they're on the program, they can call anytime, 24-7, and it will be manned by one of our IVF uh, nurses, and they should be able to answer. And if they encounter a problem and they cannot answer, it will be routed to me. So, to a physician, right? That is then, call. Then, then an on-call physician. An on-call physician, uh, who is one of our IVF sure. physicians. Right? And of course, we, we do have a lot of materials on the web with booklets and things like right. that. So by doing all of that, I find that uh, we, we are quite successful in trying to reduce the stress level. And uh, they seem to be quite happy with the program. And, uh, and then finally, to end it, if they are not successful, for example, then they come back for a consult and we will discuss about what has happened and what are the future plans. So, so that's, uh, I find it, it works. No, and that's very important, this consult after a failed cycle, yes. yeah. not to put it off uh, three or four weeks. No, no, no. Yeah. Pregnancy test negative, within a week, 10 days max, you are mm, going yes. to meet with your uh, treating uh, yeah. clinical care because team. Because that, that provides them with a, a yes. either closure, if they're not going to go on further, yeah. or to discuss next strategy of the next cycle. So, so it right. works. Mm. Well, that includes what, what we sometimes like to think of the most important team member, that's the patient, right? Because then you have the open communication, the directed communication with that patient at the appropriate time and directing them to the right information. I know, Filippo, yes. you wanted to uh, Yes, I, I want, no, I want to add something that has not yet uh, stressed so far, is the, the importance of the psychologist. The psychologist in a center, I think, is important. We have a team of psychologists that uh, assist the patient if they want, if they ask, and uh, to uh, a specific one-to-one -one, uh, uh, interview with the with the counseling with the psychologist, uh, but they assist uh, all the patients um, just maybe to say hi uh, before the um, uh, osa retrieval and uh, before the embryo transfer, and the patients like very much this because they are uh, they feel more reassured and uh, if they have any. Um, situation of uh, anxiety or whatever else, then they are reassured by the psychologist. Bashak, do you want to add the uh, yes, embryology Yes, I, I completely agree. Uh, even though now the majority of the center, uh, centers in the last decade uh, works as a uh, all team being included for the patient information, there's still so many centers uh, at which the patients only speak with the clinician and not the embryologist. And this is really stressful for the patients because uh, nearly half of the questions that the patient would arise would go directly to the embryology part. So it is, I completely agree uh, that it should be the clinician and the embryologist who should periodically inform the patient during uh, the procedures and every day in our routine practice too. Uh, just as you indicated, uh, we inform the patient daily about what's happening mm. uh, in the lab and it's a good relief for the patient to feel that their oocytes and sperm, their embryos, are very well taken care of and mm -hmm. we, we care for their uh, reproductive cells. So it is very important that clinicians, embryologists, the psychologists and the nurses work as a team to inform the patient as much as possible. And of course, the information that is given by this team uh, should always be evidence-based and uh, up-to-date uh, information. Because the internet information sometimes might be uh, not updated and they can have some mistaken ideas in their minds, so it should be corrected by the teamwork. Well, you know, something each of you said actually brought something to my mind. Uh, do you have on your own websites links to appropriate information so that if the couple is doing research before they see you for the first time, that they say, oh, I'm going to see uh, Dr. Wong, I'm going to his clinic. Uh, these are the resources that he pointed out, so let me read them first so they don't get that misinformation. Yes, yeah, of course. We have websites. And we have also the socials. The socials, so uh, Facebook, Twitter, and uh, and they can find a lot of information in the, for instance, in Facebook, we, we put a lot of information what we do, what we, so, and we have um, a huge, you cannot imagine how many contacts do we have 
uh, every day. Uh, between four or five thousand contacts every day in Facebook, for instance. And who monitors that? Uh, person that manages this. So you have so one person yes, in there? Yes, of course. You sound like the busiest person in your clinic. Yes. <laughs> um, and and Ala, you agree with this as well? Uh, yes, um, I entirely agree. Uh, we have um, uh, full information on our website. Uh, this information uh, is constantly updated. Uh, and uh, we, um, we tell uh, our patients about our advancements, our new technology. Uh, I think it is very important for patients uh, and uh, our results. And, and uh, my other follow-up question, Bashak, for you, is you talk about that constant contact with the patient. Is a part of your training or is there training available in how to communicate with patients or is it an assumption that people can just do it? Well, of course. I mean, the way how we do it in our routine practice is uh, it has to be done uh, by step by step. So the new beginners, the new embryologists who would be starting to talk with the patient first uh, attend the session together with us, with the experienced ones, and see how the dialogue between the patient and the embryologist should be. So it should be step by step. I mean, there is a training period, of course, for an embryologist to be able to uh, provide the patient the right information in the right way. Let's turn a little bit now to where we are and where we're going in this field that you've all chosen to, to be in. Pasquale, let's start with you. What do you think the most important recent advances have been and, and the ones that impacted the way you practice every day? The first thing that comes to my mind is uh, the opportunity of uh, growing embryos to, uh, for five days in the, in the laboratory without uh, compromising their, their growth. Uh, this will allow the possibility of doing a elective single embryo transfer and therefore uh, the opportunity of A, selecting the best embryo because many embryos are rest between day three to day five, just naturally. They, they are just not able to progress for their own intrinsic uh, uh, errors. But at the same time, it's also allowed us to reduce the uh, multiple pregnancy rate. That has been really a big problem and uh, by doing a single embryo transfer and not losing on the chance of a success and at the same time you are cutting a, a multiple pregnancy rate has been one of the, in my opinion, one of the biggest uh, improvement of, uh, of, of our performances. Next to that is the opportunity to try to identify the most competent embryo. Still we have to do some in, in, in a way, in an invasive uh, technology, which is the biopsy of uh, uh, trophoblast cells, which are the cells surrounding the day five blastocyst. But uh, I'm also confident, or I'm, I'm hopeful, that uh, we may be able to do it in a non-invasive way pretty soon. Atsushi, what do you think the most important advance has been that's impacted the way you practice every day? Yes. Uh in, J in Japan now, <coughs> PGS is uh, very controversial. So Japan is very conservative for the treatment of uh, reproduction, reproduction. So uh, it might be strange, but uh, the group of uh, Down uh, patient group strongly against this uh, PG uh, PGS or uh, reverse diagnosis. But uh, three years ago, the government allowed us to do everything. Now it's uh, open the door for us to do the PGS. So everybody has a right to know their own embryo's quality. So I think it's a very good thing to select the best one. So in Japan, we are uh, listening to allow transfer only one single embryo, the patient less than 34 years. And over 35 at most uh, two. 
So, as a result, remaining embryos should be quite preserved. So, quite preservation is very important. And now we are, uh, many clinics are doing the quite preserve all of the embryo at one time, not transfer the same germ cycle and wait one or two cycles and transfer the natural cycle. So the previous rate rise dramatically. So cryopreservation technique is very important. And not only for the embryo, but also for the uh, fertilized oocyte. So this uh, technique will be advanced very much. And uh, Second, now I'm very interested in the IVA, not IVM, IVA, in vitro activation. This technique is developed by uh, Dr. Kawamura in Japan. He won the best prize in the last, uh, last year's best 10 scientific uh, report. So this technique is applied for the P premature ovarian insufficiency or premature ovarian failure. So they cut, remove the ovary one side and cut, make a slice and put into the medicine. This medicine is a key point. So because, so primordial germ cells, uh, it takes uh, half a year, about six months to become mature. But in this special chemical, uh, released uh, the special uh, function to make it shorter, one or two months, from primordial germ cell to mature. So, and it activates the response to the gonotrophin. So this signal uh, is very important. So in a few years, I'm sure that this technique, not only for the uh, uh, immature warrior failure, but also the uh, poor responder. So only cut the surface of the ovary. It's uh, uh, cut the signal. It means uh, uh, suppress the function of a gene for the primordial germ cell to develop further. So cut only the surface or cut the some part of the ovary and cut, uh, cut into small pieces and transfer in the same ovary or perifemoral substance xerosa. So after that, the patient will be uh, respond dramatically. So I very uh, uh, expect this technique. Now I'm doing, and uh, my colleague have one or two ch children using this uh, for this technique. Great. So, so you gave us one that's helped and one that will help. So we, we have now and we have the future. I like yes. that. Thank you, Atsushi. Uh, Ala, what, what's the mm -hmm. one big change that's happened that's really changed the way that you practice? Uh, I think uh, there are three priority areas um, in uh, my practice. Uh, at first, PGD and PGS, and a single embryo transfer on uh, five days um, after PG, PGS or PGD. Uh, the second, uh, revolution in stimulation. Now we, we can use um, double stimulation, <laughs> we can use um, different protocol and uh, segmentation cycle and um, um, all these due to technology vitrification. Uh, and uh, the third, I think, um, the technology of cryopreservation of ovarian tissue. Uh, I think it is future. Uh, and uh, now we can um, help uh, the patients, ca cancer patients uh, in Russia be um, 
uh, we are looking for board uh, the first uh, delivery after these uh, techniques. And in future, this technique, uh, technique will be used for um, patients with uh, premature uh, ovarian failure. And this uh, technique, um, we listen, uh, we hear this um, about this technique. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. PC, what changed the world for you? Um, so far, all the things mentioned applies to me. The time lapse, the paper, the screening, the vitrification, which has now changed the way we freeze our embryos and eggs. Uh, finally, uh, the implementation of the trigger in the antagonist cycle to achieve zero ovarian hyperstimulation. That is very significant. And uh, so, in our practice, uh, we have just in the last one or two years, we have changed the way I practice compared to two years ago. And of course, looking expectantly with the, what Tanaka has said about in vitro activation, and also the, uh, I think call it the mitochondrial transfer or cytoplasmic transfer. These two techniques, I think, will see how we can uh, treat women with premature ovary insufficiency, the poor responders. You see, so far, whatever we have done, we couldn't have helped older patients, older women, right? We mentioned earlier, age being the single most important determinant of success of IVF. So how do we reverse this? So far, none of this can do that. <coughs> so I'm hoping that the IVA in vitro activation and the uh, cytoplasm transfer will probably be a rescue to older women. Thank you. Filippo, you know, I'm, I'm holding you up for last. Yes. You knew that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Filippo, what so far. So for us, what changed dramatically in the last two or three years is the, is the way to uh, select the best embryo with high chance to implant to give a live birth. This changed everything, changed the clinical part and in the lab part. In the lab part, uh, all, the, all our treatment go to blastocyst uh, stage um, development of the embryo. And then most of them, especially those that comes from women more than 35 years old, and uh, they, uh, these embryos we are analyzed with pre-implantation genetic screening. So we do a lot of pre-implantation genetic screening. And pre-implantation genetic screening does not increase the chance of a woman to get pregnant. So it does not in increase the efficacy of the treatment, but increases the efficiency of the treatment. So it means that uh, in that pool of blastocysts, you have always those, those that will implant or not, but if you select before, then you will uh, reduce the useless transfer, you will uh, reduce the miscarriages, you will increase the chance of the embryo transfer to implant, and you will dramatically increase, uh, decrease the multiple pregnancies. And you reduce the time to pregnancy because in these older patients, time to pregnancy is a very important issue. So we just have been accepted in the human reproduction paper where applying this strategy, we uh, maintain the same cumulative live birth rate than, the, than three years ago, but we, we decrease dramatically the multiple pregnancy rate and or to almost zero and uh, uh, we improved a lot the efficiency of the treatment so this of course has to to do this you must have a very technological laboratory you must have a very uh, good cryopreservation preservation program vitrification program because all those cycles are segmented so we are doing transfer uh, with uh, vitrified uh, blastocyst after they are screened. So uh, it's, uh, the, the work in the clinical part and in the lab has doubled, but I think that the, this much more amount of work is justified uh, because of the improvement of the efficiency of the patients or the treatment. Thank you. So you've had a long time to think about what changed your world. So there's no pressure. No pressure. <laughs> yeah, we're 20 minutes. All the clinicians are okay. now waiting to yeah. hear. Okay. Well, so. as it is indicated by all the clinicians, the majority of the recent developments that would increase the ART success are on the laboratory part. Of course, it's unquestionable. Uh, for an embryologist, the, the major roles, the three major roles, 
uh, to my view. The first one is to culture the reproductive cells as viable as possible in our laboratories. So as it was indicated by Pasquale, now thanks to the recent developments in culture conditions, culture mediums, we are able to culture the embryos up to blastocyst stage without compromising their viability. So this is one of the most important roles. The second one, once we culture the embryos viably, the second one, the second obstacle is the time to select the best one in the most objective way and transfer one or maximum two embryos to the patient. So uh, I would say that in this part, embryo selection part, there have been the, the, the majority of the recent developments have been done on this part, on embryo selection. Even though there are several biomarkers that are described in the literature, uh, so far I would say that the only two of them are in routine practice, in clinical IVF, and one would be the time-lapse technology, as it was indicated, uh, and the second one would be the PGS, of course. So the recent developments are mainly on these two embryo selection methods. Of course, for the future, there will be more maybe biomarkers which may be more cost-effective, more non-invasive, and more objective in terms of embryo selection. And the third role is, as we have more than one embryos produced per patient, we need to maintain uh, uh, the cumulative pregnancy rates in a constant success. So we, this means that we need to cryopreserve the excess embryos as successful as possible. So on this matter, in the cryopreservation, I would say that the vitrification technique, the new technique, is, uh, could be considered as the second breakthrough after the ICSI procedure. So it's not only for the maintenance of the cumulative pregnancy rates, but it's also a breakthrough for the fertility preservation, for oocyte vitrification, as we were not uh, very successful to do it with the old technique. So these are the three uh, important roles and important recent developments that have been done uh, in the ART field. So you know what I've noticed about this interprofessional team? You have given answers that have made my question better. Because if you remember, I asked what one thing changed your world, and nobody gave less than two. So I love that because you gave us so much good information. But we're coming to the time where we have to sort of wrap up. So I'm going to ask a question, but I'm going to frame it in a way you might not like. Oh, see Pasquale is uh, okay. leaning in. In one sentence, what one thing would you say to your OBGYN colleagues, bring, going back to something we, want, we mentioned before, that would be most helpful to get the patients who need specialist intervention to that specialist quicker? Don't let them waste time. Great. Bashar. Well, I completely agree with Philippe on that. Age is the, is the main obstacle that we can't uh, pass. So I would agree. Avoid meddlesome activity, send them early. In that meaning, send the patients early. You know, and this is really the most important message, uh, Lawrence. I will just add that uh, to, get in, to get themselves information, you know, get themselves educated. Uh, I, I, I don't want that we leave unmentioned that the development of uh, fertility preservation, whether for for medical reason or for uh, elective reason, is something that the, the general OBGYN community needs to be made aware of, uh, including also the oncologists and others, but uh, they need to be made aware that uh, even for rheumatic disease, lupus, or any other things, these couples, these patients, they need to be counseled, they need, and they love to receive information from the primary care providers who happens to be a general OBGYN. Uh, so I'm, I'm uh, foreseeing a future where when a woman goes for their annual well exam, in addition to having the pap smear or the prescription for the birth control pill, they can also get information about, you know, what are you thinking about the reproductive plans, you know, and, you know, age is the most important factor. And uh, if that's the case, you know, you may want to start to consider some Elective, uh, uh, elective fertility preservation procedure or have a consultation with the reproductive uh, endocrinologist. Excellent, thank you. Atsushi, what one thing would you tell them? One thing I mentioned that, <laughs> that uh, <coughs> uh, uh, 
Yes. I say to OBA joint doctors, uh, all of them recognize if couples are healthy and uh, no uh, abnormal findings in the HSG and uh, mess about the temperature, they think, oh, all of you, uh, you are healthy. So please, you don't need to go to the hospital. But uh, I would like to, to, to say, so this finding is not true. About 20% or 30% of uh, patients who have uh, HS, normal HSC findings has uh, actually have a femoral adhesion. So I think I would like to tell, to tell them the importance of laparoscopy. So please tell them you should do the, receive the examination of laparoscopy. Excellent. And Allah, you have the mm. last word. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, I would like, uh, I entirely agree with Tanaka that, uh, 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 no, sorry, with, uh, with Pasquale <laughs> uh, about um, uh, we have to get, um, uh, we have to give full uh, maximum information uh, to our patients and um, help the patients choice the mm, necessary to treatment. Uh, we have to um, ask, um, we have to tell about different uh, technique and um, together with patients uh, choice um, mm, uh, the mm, the most uh, convenient for, for patients uh, method of treatment. So, so you hit on time to treatment, age of patient, and a great deal of education for the primary care women's health care yeah. provider Perfect. so that that optimizes that first part of the journey to get in so that they have the best potential outcome. That's right. Well, with that, I'd like to thank you all for talking with me today, and I think you all gave us really great stuff to think about. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you Lawrence. Thank you, thank you. Thank you Lawrence.